Uh, usually genealogy is a do-it-yourself hobby, but sometimes there comes a point when it makes sense to call in a professional. Who, when, where, and how of hiring a professional genealogist might help you decide to hire a genealogist to help you. So today, Deborah's going to share uh, with us that, but I want to tell you a little bit about Deborah. Uh, for the past three years, Deborah has been a professional genetic genealogy researcher with Legacy Tree Genealogist. Uh, it's the highest rated genealogy research company in the world. And before that time, she worked as an independent contractor uh, for her clients through her company, Eureka Genealogy. She has co-led the Louisville Genealogical Society's DNA Special Interest Group since 2014, and she has been a member of the LGS since 2011. So today we welcome Deborah Renard as our presenter. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so uh, the, the title for this presentation went through a couple uh, morphs, shall we say. It started off as just when to hire a professional genealogist. And uh, that's the, the title Nancy suggested. And we decided maybe that was a little too narrow. And so we um, added uh, who, when, where, and how. And then this week I added the why in there too. So I think we've got pretty much most of the question words covered here. So um, we'll be talking about all those factors for hiring a professional genealogist. And so to start off, um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the context for my remarks and in the interest of uh, uh, transparency and disclosure, tell you a little bit more about the company that I work for, uh, which is, as Nancy said, Legacy Tree Genealogist. It was founded in 2004. It's based in Salt Lake City, Utah. As Nancy said, it is the highest client-rated genealogy research firm in the world. And it does not have any connection to legacy family tree webinars. This is a common continual point of confusion. We love legacy family tree webinars. I speak for them pretty often, but there's, there's no relationship there. This is strictly a research company. Uh, the staff for the company is... Um, remote. Um, they ha we have contacts and access to records worldwide. The core team of the company has, um, all of them have one or more of these items listed here, um, a degree in family history or genealogy or in genetics, uh, 10 or more years of genealogy experience. Uh, many have professional accreditation in genealogy. And we'll talk about what that means in a little while. Uh, the entire team, not just the core group, is held to very high standards of research, analysis, and writing through a very rigorous editing process on our work products. And as Nancy said, um, I do work as a genetic genealogist for the team, work with, with the DNA group there. And I specialize in unknown birth family situations. So what does a professional genealogist do exactly? Well, of course, they trace ancestry, including um, immigrant ancestors, investigate location, specific time periods. They also work the other direction, identifying descendants of a particular ancestor. Uh, we work to locate records, saving our clients time and travel costs for locating those themselves. Um, in my team in particular, we analyze DNA test results. We can share advice to clients about tackling research problems themselves. We often have to decipher old handwriting, uh, translate foreign records. Uh, I do quite a bit of teaching and lecturing on genealogical topics, as do um, a number of our staff members. And we also locate missing people. And that could be um, related to unknown birth family. It could be um, an air search, perhaps forensic type work. So why should you consider hiring a professional genealogist? And I guess that boils down to the question of what can one do for you that you can't do yourself? 
one of the main things that you'll gain, of course, is time, which is a precious commodity for all of us. For your tree, you will want to have a primary source document to prove each piece of information that's included, whether it's a, a birth or a death, a marriage, um, a link from one generation to another. You want to have supporting documentation for each of the facts that you include. And of course, not all of those source documents are online. A professional can be more efficient and cost-effective at producing a well-sourced, accurate family tree. And time especially becomes a consideration if you're producing something for a special event, such as uh, someone's birthday, an anniversary celebration, perhaps a family reunion, maybe some overseas travel that you need to prepare for. It'd be a great time to perhaps call in a professional genealogist to help you prepare for that. They can, of course, assist with dealing with brick walls, which most of us have at least one dead end in our tree. Some of us have quite a few that we need help breaking down. And professionals do have experience with difficult research problems. They have uh, the knowledge and skills to solve those. Very often a, a brick wall to resolve it is going to require some in-depth research in uh, less readily available records, such as land, tax, and probate records, court records, and many of those um, often are not available online. They can assist in situations where there's a language barrier, where you need to do some uh, foreign research, perhaps. Uh, your ancestors likely came from another place uh, at one point in time and spoke a language that you don't know. And the records for your family may be in a variety of languages on different lines. So professional genealogy team members often speak and read many different languages. It's certainly the case within our company. I'm always amazed at, at the number of languages that uh, uh, some of our, our staff are fluent in. And then you can also access on-site partners who can visit remote archives instead of having to plan an expensive overseas trip yourself to access those records. More reasons that you might want to consider hiring a professional, um, Lineage Society membership. Each one has different requirements, but they all have pretty strict policies as far as the docu documentation uh, supporting that lineage. And then lots of times you'll find there's a problem generation that needs more in-depth research. It needs um, the pulling together of circumstantial evidence and then making a, a proof argument or a proof summary to make the connection from uh, one generation to another. And so a professional can help collect the documentation that's needed for a successful Lineage Society application. Another advantage is um, if you're working with a research company as opposed to just one individual, you have the advantage of a team approach. Um, maybe you need just a fresh set of eyes on the research that you've been working on. Maybe a record that you found quite some time ago has a clue that you didn't think at the time was important or you just didn't happen to notice it. A professional is going to review your previous work and determine other paths for research. If you hire a research company, then typically your family tree will be seen by at least two or three different professionals within the company. Uh, for example, um, I, as the researcher, produce certain deliverables. Those are reviewed by my project manager, and then they are um, uh, gone through thoroughly by a quality assurance editor as well. So you have that whole team supporting that research. DNA analysis is another uh, advantage to working with a professional. Of course, DNA is now a major part of a great deal of genealogy research. A lot of people have performed testing, but they don't necessarily know what the results mean. Uh, they don't even know if they took the right test or which test would be best suited for their particular research question they're trying to answer. And so DNA specialists can advise you about 
which test to take in which circumstance. They can analyze your results and determine what the next steps in your research should be. And then finally, just validation. You can use a professional to see if the research that you've done yourself over possibly many years is correct. A uh, professional can review it, check out the quality of your sources, help fill in any gaps that might exist, and uh, correct any errors that are present so that you don't research the wrong line. So how do you go about choosing a professional genealogist? Uh, genealogists are not required to be licensed or to be certified, but you want to have confidence in their knowledge and their skills. You want to make sure if you're working with a company or an individual that they are trustworthy, that they're the right fit for you, and that their work will stand the test of time and last for many generations of your family. So some questions you want to ask. How long have they been in business? What are their fees, of course? Um, hourly rates can vary anywhere from uh, $30 or $40 to well over $200 per hour, depending upon the researcher's experience, uh, the location in which you're researching, what type of project it is, um, how much in demand that researcher is or that company is, uh, what their time constraints might be, and so forth. And most researchers are also going to charge for travel, uh, copies, postage, other expenses of those types. You want to consider what, what is their availability. Many researchers may be booked uh, for months in advance. And then once they do become available, the project may take several months longer. So you need to uh, consider, do you have uh, any constraints as far as the time frame within which you want this work done? Some will offer rush service for a higher fee. So that's something you can consider if it's important to you. Have you defined the details of uh, the research? Have you come up with very specific focus project goals? Um, what are the hours that you want put in on this research? What are the fees again? Um, do you have deadlines? What deliverables do you want? And what deliverables does the researcher offer? Uh, discussion about copyright, uh, publication rights, to determine who will have control of that, um, what communication channels are suitable, all of these details you want to get in writing. And then it's really important to stay in touch, of course, with your researcher. Um, many problems and misunderstandings can be avoided if you just have enough regular, clear communication. And keep in mind, if you do have a question or a concern, don't hesitate to bring that up with the researcher. So how do we evaluate a professional's work and skills? One way is through looking at work samples of theirs. So it's good to review some samples so you know what to expect from this person you're considering hiring. The main deliverable, of course, in any genealogy work is going to be <clears throat> information that's added to your family tree. But uh, the basis for those additions is going to be conveyed through a research report that will be fully uh, documented. So you want to make sure that the person you're considering or the company you're considering um, has the type of deliverable and the quality of deliverable that you want. You also want to consider um, their use of the genealogical proof standard and whether they use your time effectively. So does, does their work meet the genealogical proof standard? We call this the GPS for short. And it was uh, formalized in the year 2000 and then revised just in 2019 by the Board for Certification of Genealogists, or the BCG. The guidelines that it in includes are um, how to research thoroughly and sufficiently, uh, how to document properly, how to analyze and correlate evidence, 
how to resolve conflicts that arise in the research, and um, how to write clear and convincing genealogical reports. So if the genealogist that you work with adheres to the GPS, then it's going to um, produce supportable conclusions. Then does the genealogist use time efficiently? So uh, there's a general process, of course, for um, starting genealogical research. You start from the readily available records that are online, uh, sources that are indexed so you can get to the records um, easily. Then you progress to using microfilm, other less accessible records. And then you move on to networking with others for on-site records from repositories that are not as accessible and working within that network. Copying records, uh, producing proper citations of your sources, and then uh, writing about the findings in a report, that takes a lot of time. It's not just the research itself. So a professional's value to you is not just in finding records by any means, but in making sense of them and explaining their relevance to your ancestors. You want to kind of be cautious about any time you see a sample report that involves early ancestry before, say, 1850, that only uses easy, what we call easy sources, like uh, online trees that others have built, or compiled sources where people have just gathered information into a book, but it may not be well sourced. And um, if you, <clears throat> pardon me, if you see um, a sample report like that, then they may be relying on the unproven work of others as opposed to doing original research themselves. Another way to evaluate a professional's work is by checking out public reviews. And, you know, uh, finding a, a, a recommended quality genealogist by word of mouth is not always easy and it's not always reliable. It's not like talking to your neighbor about, oh, who did your landscaping? It looks great. So um, you can check online reviews for genealogists, um, including checking them out in the Better Business Bureau, um, Facebook, Google+, Angie's List, Yelp, those kinds of sites. You can uh, try just <clears throat> entering them in a Google search um, their name plus the word reviews to find relevant information. And of course, you can also ask for, uh, ask, ask the researcher for references from their previous clients and see what they have to say as well. Another way to evaluate a professional's work is through their credentials. Uh, there are two main uh, certifying credentials in genealogy. Uh, one is the accredited genealogist credential. It's issued through um, ICAPGen, is what we call that for short. And then the other main credential is a certified genealogist or a CG, which is issued through the board for certification of genealogists. We'll talk about these in a little more detail in a moment. And then there's also a few additional types of uh, less formal credentials to consider as well. So first, the uh, AG, the Accredited Genealogist. So someone who earns this uh, certification has passed several levels of testing. It's done through, as we said, that ICAPGen, that stands for the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, long name. And uh, the testing for this um, certification is geographically specific. You might choose to um, certify in uh, Southern United States research or German research or whatever specific area of, of interest you might have. <clears throat> the professional would. And um, this certification includes a four-generation research report, includes a written exam, includes an oral exam, and then they are to adhere to a specified code of ethics. So it's a very rigorous process. The other main 
certification, certified genealogist or CG done through the Board for Certification of Genealogists. And the, the process is pretty similar to the accredited genealogist, but it's not geographically specific. It's more um, methodology focused. So they're evaluating the genealogist's ability to um, analyze and interpret documents, to um, be able to resolve contradictory evidence that may be encountered, and they have to make a submission of a, a very extensive portfolio that will be uh, reviewed by multiple uh, professionals. And then again, those who are certified must agree to a code of ethics here as well. Some other organizations uh, for helping evaluate a professional's work. And they also uh, provide support to professional genealogists. And then if any concerns or conflicts arise between a, a genealogist and a client, they provide mediation for those situations. And again, they're expected to um, adhere to a code of professionalism and conduct. And these types of organizations, the first one here is the Association of Professional Genealogists, or APG, uh, based in Denver, Colorado. Um, I've been a member of that for several years myself. And um, they recently, in the past couple years, have also instituted continuing education requirements for their members. Another reason that you'll want to be familiar with the APG is it's a great source for you for finding genealogists um, who are available for hire in their membership list. Another one is uh, CAFGE, the Council for Advancement of Forensic Genealogy, and it's based in Plano, Texas. And so they are um, primarily focused on legal matters. They also delve into the world of DNA a little bit as well, but a lot of, for example, air search, um, mineral rights. So if, if you need a specialist in one of those areas, this would be a good source for that. Um, something more international, the Association of Gene Genealogists and Researchers in Archives, or AGRA, is based in London. And Accredited Genealogist Ireland, AGI, is another source for uh, professionals. So we also want to consider some additional credentials that are even less formal, though. Um, one of those might be academic programs. For example, there is a bachelor's degree in family history and genealogy offered at Brigham Young University in Provo. Um, someone might obtain a Master of Arts in History or a Master of Library Science. It could be a credential for genealogical uh, research. Uh, Boston University offers a 15-week certificate in genealogical research. And then there's the uh, University of Strathclyde, which is um, in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, they offer a degree in genealogical paleography and heraldic studies. You can also look to see if a professional genealogist has taken advantage of certification programs such as the National Genealogical Society's home study course called the American Genealogy Home Study Course. So they might have done uh, that work. Uh, they may have attended institutes. Um, several of us have done attended a number of these institutes, which are usually uh, one week long courses and you focus on a particular area of genealogy study. So these include uh, the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh or GRIP, the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy or SLIG, the Institute for Genealogical and Historical Research or IGER. And then, uh, and so those three are um, week-long courses held in specific locations in the country, um, typically in the summer. Then there's also ProGen. This is a self-study program that incorporates some peer review of the work that you do as you progress through um, this resource. And it's based on um, something called, a, a, a volume called Professional Genealogy, 
Preparation, Practice, and Standards, edited by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And so there are these um, study groups that form as genealogists work through this material. And then, really, there's nothing wrong with considering someone who is self-taught. There are many competent genealogists who don't seek official credentials. Uh, they may have uh, education that's supportive of uh, genealogical um, knowledge and skill. Uh, it may be just that they're a very experienced researcher and they may have lots of satisfied clients and that can be a great credential just by itself. So when you're considering hiring a professional, it's really important to have realistic expectations. Uh, as we all know, sometimes genealogy can lead to disappointments, to surprises, to frustration. And so I want to share with you some principles for having realistic expectations for um, the relationship that you may have with a professional genealogist. So first of all, you need to consider what are the limitations of historical research. I hear this a lot that <laughs> people kind of think that genealogists who are professionals have some exclusive access to a secret database that's only available to professional researchers and it's not available to the general public. That's not the case at all. Uh, we work with the same resources that you do. Um, some of the differences might be that we would be more likely to have subscriptions to particular websites, um, access to records that are behind paywalls that you, you could access to if you chose to. But we have uh, access to these kinds of resources more routinely. Uh, we may have more experience with where to look for particular records and what records are available in a particular location or how to analyze DNA results that um, a genealogy hobbyist might not have that knowledge. Um, we may have a network of other researchers who can pull records in distant archives. But uh, as far as limitations of, of your research, you have to keep in mind that sometimes the records for a specific area are not going to be accessible because of natural disasters, floods, burned counties, as you call them. Uh, sometimes key records that uh, should be there just aren't. They, they may have never even been created or they don't contain the right information, uh, enough information, pieces are missing or some of it's incorrect. So that's obviously a hindrance. Sometimes records are locked behind restrictive public access laws. Sometimes it's a matter of uh, time having passed since the uh, event that the record relates to. But sometimes, for privacy reasons, certain areas choose to keep those records unavailable. Sometimes they are available, but they're not in good shape. They're poorly organized or they're not indexed. And so a professional will have to, or, or yourself, would have to do a page-by-page -page search, which is not usually too fun. Another um, principle for having realistic expectations, obstacles sometimes appear. Now, um, there may be some awareness of limitations to your goal up front and clients can be warned if their goal is not going to be obtainable or it's going to be very time consuming. Um, when, when I get a new project, one of the things that I do is do an initial review and before I start into the meat of the research and let the client know, um, here's some of the challenges that I see that we're going to have with meeting your goal and why. Um, a lot of times, though, obstacles that come up cannot be identified in advance until after uh, the research has begun and you've gotten into it a little ways. There's a difference between um, a project that is impossible and one that is just difficult, but not necessarily impossible, but it's gonna be really time consuming. Uh, solving a, a difficult mystery that you've been working on for decades, it may be doable, but it may not be quick, it may not be easy. So you need to weigh uh, cost versus benefit. Is it 
going to be worth it to you for what you're going to have to invest to solve this difficult mystery. Bottom line here is that when you hire a professional, you are paying for their time, their effort, and their expertise. It's really, really important to understand you are not paying for a specific guaranteed result. That's just not possible. And you want to be very cautious about hiring a genealogist who claims otherwise. What a professional should guarantee is that they will use your project time as effectively as possible in their effort to achieve your research goal. A uh, fourth item about realistic expectations is it really is important for you as the client to establish and communicate your priorities. Um, you want to have very specific, uh, very clearly worded objectives. That's very critical. You are the one who can decide how much research a professional genealogist performs on your behalf. And you can define exactly how you want that time spent to the extent possible. Another choice you can make is the level of detail, but it's going to be a balance between detail and the time and cost uh, required for that level of detail. And that, that also applies to, um, it, there's a balance between the level of detail and the chronological um, extent of your research. The more in detail you want to go, then the less lesser time period that you're going to be able to cover for a given um, investment of time and funds. You want to make sure that you share everything you know before uh, the research begins. Uh, a good foundation for research involves quite a bit of effort on the part of the client up front before the genealogist even starts um, working on your projects. And that's so that everything you've already done, you're not paying for time to duplicate work that you've already accomplished. It's very, very disappointing when uh, one of us as, as a researcher gets really excited about something that we found for a client, and then we realize that it was unnecessary because the client says, oh, I already knew that, I already found that. Well, you know, so, so make sure that you communicate everything you know that's relevant to your research up front. But on the other hand, don't overwhelm your researcher with a big pile of disorganized notes and some of them are relevant and some of them are not. Um, you know, whatever you pass on to the, the researcher, uh, your research time is going to be spent on them reading uh, that research and evaluating it and trying to decide, is this something I need to, to um, keep handy because it's relevant or is it not? It's all going to consume your project time. So it's really important to focus what you provide the researcher. Another really important point is if the research that you have done is not cited, is not sourced, then the researcher is going to need to go back to verify it with original research to make sure that they're not uh, extending incorrect lines. And so this is something else. I mean, you can certainly, you know, pay a researcher to do that. If you don't want to do that, if you're pretty sure that your research is valid, um, then you'll want to come up with the sources that you use if they're not present and make sure that it's um, all cited and ready to go for the researchers so you don't waste time on that effort. So the, the um, goal is to have a well-sourced tree ready with a summary of what you know about the research goal already, along with the records you've found that are relevant to it, and then a specification of what your questions are uh, related to it. What, what are, what's your goal to accomplish relevant to this information? And then they can become familiar with your case very easily. They can review your records and they can create a research plan for what the most relevant next steps are going to be. Lastly, 
And this is always uh, especially the case with DNA, but it can be the case with uh, traditional records research as well. Be prepared for surprises. Whether you're working with historical records or DNA, uh, surprises can and do arise. So some of the things that you want to mentally prepare yourself for, one might be, this is the biggie, misattributed parentage. Another would be possibly incorrect family trees. You were certain that this tree was solid and it may be found that uh, there's an issue with it that needs to be corrected. A lot of times erroneous beliefs about ethnicity, whether it's the uh, Cherokee Indian princess or whatever that um, family story is that's been passed down, need to be open to the fact that it may not be quite as has been believed in the past. And then a lot of times there are revelations about misbehavior or about criminal activity. Again, you just need to be prepared for some of these possibilities that could come up. All can be uncovered during the research. Uh, an ethical genealogist will present the truth, no matter how difficult it may be to hear it, but they will do so uh, with confidentiality and uh, the client's privacy should, of course, always be respected. In conclusion, you want to be very confident that you're hiring someone who will give you top quality results. What you're buying though, you have to keep in mind, is not a straightforward product. It's not like ordering something from Amazon. So sometimes for different reasons, the answers are just legitimately not available despite uh, a genealogist's best efforts in often the best that anyone could have done. The answer may not be accessible. Some of the reasons for that could be due to record loss, again, because of a, a flood or fire, um, privacy laws and other restrictions. Um, maybe if you're trying to prove something genetically, you don't have the particular type of tester that's needed to um, prove a particular point and so forth. So again, let's put the same thing a little bit different way. Rather than a guarantee of certain information, what you're getting is a pledge that a genealogist will use uh, your paid time effectively and search for information in the best way possible. Some of the sources that I used today for this presentation, um, one of the main ones by far is the blog that we have on our Legacy Tree uh, Genealogist website. We have multiple articles regarding working with professional genealogists on there, logically enough. Um, I will put in a plug for our blog though, just in general. It is um, very extensive because we as employees are uh, required every few months to write a blog article as part of our job. So um, they're on any subject you can think of related to genealogy and they are searchable by subject. So uh, even if you're not considering hiring a professional genealogist, go ahead and check out our blog. It's uh, got lots of great information on many, many topics. Uh, also, there was a, an article by the Association of Professional Genealogists, APG, about how to hire a professional genealogist. Family Search has a good article on hiring a professional researcher. And then there's a site called the Genealogy Reporter that had one called What is a Professional Genealogist? And those are some of the sources I used for compiling today's um, lecture. So thank you very much for attending today. And um, please feel free to contact me at my work email, deborah.renard at legacytree.com. Uh, you can request more information about our services at the address you see here, legacytree.com uh, forward slash Deborah R, D-E-B-R-A-R. You can also learn more, as I said, on our blog. And at this time, I'd be glad to entertain questions, Nancy.
Okay, Deborah, excellent. And we do have some really good questions here. Good. good. Pamela asked right off the bat, will your presentation be recorded and posted later? It and is still being recorded right now as we speak. And I'm pretty sure we're posting it on our website. Yes. And it will be on our YouTube website. Um, one question that came out right away as you started was, uh, how do you find uh, work samples of genealogists? Well, you would, this is if you have a candidate that you are considering hiring, you would would request uh, normally. Now, having said that, some professional genealogists do have their own website and they will post sample cases on their website. Um, that's not always going to be the case, but you can look for that at least and see if that is offered. And if it's not, then just ask the genealogist that you're considering for samples. Um, at our company that I work for, for example, at Legacy Tree, we do have a number of sample cases posted on our website that you can check out and get an idea of what our work is like. Somebody just posted, is there a handout? Yes, the handout has just been posted in the chat if you haven't downloaded it, but you should have received one this morning in an email. So if you registered yes. for the Zoom presentation, you should have received a handout in an email this morning. And if you still need one, I'm sure we can get one to you. Um, you can email one of our tech or Phil Heisel or our society, anybody could get you one there. So uh, Pamela, she asked, and this is uh, an interesting question, could you elaborate on copyright and publication rights? You mentioned that early on in your presentation. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, when I was, I, I don't have to deal with this now, which is one of the reasons I went to work for Legacy Tree Genealogist, so I didn't have to deal with the business side so much. But um, when I was working as an independent uh, researcher, um, you know, I had a pretty technical legalese kind of contract and it spelled out um, like, like the client would need to initial as far as um, what our understanding was with regard to copyright, whether they would own the copyright or I as the producer of the deliverable would own the copyright as far as like the report, for example, or um, um, the, what was it called? Publication, what'd you say, Nancy? Uh, let's see. I don't remember the phrase uh, that I used. Elaborate on copyright and publication rights. And then publication rights. Okay. Right. So let's say, let's say that I do um, a project for a client and it is just really, really interesting and it comes out great and learned a lot of fascinating stuff. And I think, golly, this would be great to publish in uh, the queue, maybe. Um uh, or um, in the uh, APG quarterly, or in the Louisville Genealogical Society's quarterly, or wherever. Um, we, it helps to have an agreement up front if the client will um, allow, consider allowing that, that um, right for me to publish the work. And um, so that's one of the things that, you need to have a, dis even if you don't decide definitely up front, you want to start that discussion to learn if anyone has any um, hard stop about uh, copyright or publication um, opportunities. You answered this one, can professionals access records that we can't access? And I think you kind of, you want to review now, that again? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes and no. You, you would have the ability to access any records that we can if you so chose to pursue the uh, logistics needed to access them. In other words, it may be in a paid database. It may be you know, behind some other kind of paywall. Um, it may be in a remote repository that we have developed contacts with people in that country, um, maybe in uh, Ukraine or wherever it might be. We, ha we have, golly gee, we have um, a network all over the globe, really, of researchers that we interact with. So not really, but yes, we do because we have invested the time and effort to set up those networks to access records. But it's not that you couldn't if you so chose to make that effort as well. Excellent, excellent. Here's a good question just came in. This is from John Weeder. 
How does one mm -hmm. adequately prepare prior work, known documentation, DNA results, and online family trees? And in what form is our research sent to the professionals? So this is, what do we do to get ready to give you what we've done? Yes, okay, so uh, we definitely prefer things to come to us digitally and not necessarily hard copies. I had a, had a client uh, end of last year, beginning of this year that sent a big box <laughs> And, and it was, yes. and it was all relevant, you know, as I said, I do a lot of unknown birth family work, and this is all relevant to her known side. It wasn't even, it wasn't even things that could help with answering the unknown side. But anyway, um, yeah, so it could be in the form of um, online trees, you know, you don't have to print out a family tree, just give us access to your ancestry tree or your MyHeritage tree or, you know, wherever you have built that. Um, yeah, it may be some uh, research report that you have written for your own research. I, I've heard talks before about people who are researching their own families uh, the talk encourages them to treat it as if they were a professional researcher researching their own family and going ahead and documenting their research process. And, and uh, so if you've done something like that, you definitely want to include that. Um, family stories, you know, they can be important, especially in unknown family situations. So you wanna get that down in writing, but again, uh, digital is great. Uh, just anything that you think would be helpful, but relevant to your research question, you'd want to um, forward that to us. And I, I know that with our um, research company in any company situation, as opposed to working with an individual genealogist, they're gonna have secure portals for uh, sending in say password access to uh, accounts that you may have, DNA results and so forth. Uh, an individual researcher may not have that. You just need to share it through more traditional channels. Sounds like we have to do our homework. It, there's the, the more homework you do, the more preparation, diligent preparation you make, the more efficiently your time will be used and the more progress that your researcher is going to make. That's good. Uh, this is a very general answer. So maybe you can throw out one or two recommendations. Pamela asked, how does a person who is just beginning find resources to research? I'll let you suggest to her. <laughs> that sounds like, sounds like a good one for you, Nint. Um, yeah, well, you, you know, um, they're, the basic resources are going to be the most useful, whether you're a very beginner or you're a professional. Like, for example, of course, Ancestry.com. You're going to want to build your family tree there and starting from just the family you know and, and look for uh, records, record hints to, to build out that tree, uh, family search, um, uh, find my past, uh, my heritage, all those websites that, um, that allow you to provide, uh, gather information. Um, you're going to do that kind of work no matter what level you're on. And certainly if you're starting out, those are gonna be your go-to resources up front. Um, interview the people in your family to, to learn about uh, ancestors that are fairly recent and capture that information from them and uh, family photos, uh, all those good resources. Anything to add to that, Nancy? Yeah, go yes, on. I highly and I would recommend Pamela, if you're a member of LGS, you can go behind our wall and get to several videos that we have already made. And I did one on how do you begin your family research, Pamela. Yay. So that might be a very good video to watch. Perfect. Um, if you uh, join our society, you can get behind our wall there to see the many different recordings we have of workshops and programs that we have presented over the past year. Great suggestion. Um, Another question here, who is this one from? Phil's asking, is there a fee for initial consultation to determine the cost and the size of the undertaking? Excellent question. 
I guess that's going to depend on the genealogist. I know with the company I work for, there is not. Um, you're going to talk with a, a customer service rep person and going to discuss what uh, what your goals are, what information you already have, just in a very general sense, um, and uh, what level of project. At, at our company, we have three levels of projects. Um, a 25 hour, 50 hour, 100 hour um, would be appropriate considering your goals. Um, we also have something new that I'll, I'll mention just because it's most relevant to me. Um, it's called DIY DNA, do it yourself DNA, and it's for unknown parentage situations. And so um, you can buy five sessions of consultations where a consultant will uh, you know walk you through some steps for trying to figure out the answer to your um, unknown parentage question yourself and help you through that process um, so that's a, a you know one of the lower end products that's available again it's going to vary depending upon the company and the individual uh, professional as well well, Deborah, I have a question following up on that one. That was specifically for DNA, but what if I had a brick wall? Is there a, a fee I can pay to consult with somebody who would then help me develop a plan where I could then continue to research myself? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to see. Okay, so I'm out at the, oh, I'm not shared. Okay, so this is our website, Legacy Tree Genealogist. Excellent. Again, I don't mean for this to be a big commercial. I, I just, it's an example since the question was raised. So um, that's the basic 25, standard 50, premium 100. Uh, if you can't decide which is appropriate, you can, it mentions that you can go through comparative sample reports so you can see what you could expect to get for the different levels. Um, here's the DIY DNA that I mentioned. Okay, so the Mini 10, that's one possibility. Um, so it's for beginning professional research on your family tree for like one to three generations on one line in one location. And so that's something that's definitely more focused in a, a particular brick wall situation perhaps that, that might uh, uh, be relevant for that. We also do heritage travel plans, um, but I think there's also we have we have consultations that um, are available as well, and that's similar to the DIY DNA, but it's not DNA related as you're saying, and um, so it would be uh, a series of. Oh, I take that back. In this case, it's not a series of consultations as with the DIY, it's just a 45 minute uh, consultation mm -hmm. that you are purchasing. And so, yes, they would be giving you very focus specific advice for the scenario that you present to them. So, and that's available in a DNA perspective or in a traditional research perspective as well. Okay, um, many comments on very interesting, very informative. Thank you. Uh, great handout. Um, oh, here's a good one from Jamie. She says, just for fun, Deborah, have you found that clients come to you after watching genealogy TV shows and they have unrealistic expectations <laughs> of, of it uh, the time it takes <laughs> and what it would take you to hire? Yes, it happens. <laughs> Yes, I bet. Um, yeah, we, we, we often comment about that amongst ourselves about, um, you know, the, the shows are great in that they generate interest, but on the other hand, sometimes the expectations they create are not very realistic, so that people don't realize what has gone on in the background to um, support that uh, uh, meeting of the, uh, the, that's the limited part that we see on TV. Okay, here's, you might want to stop your uh, video because we're looking at your screen here. We probably want to look at you as you answer these last couple questions. 
Um, Got it. One, this one's very general, and you'll be very good at giving an answer to this. And this person, it's Pamela again. What do the different DNA tests focus on? And I know that's a presentation you have already done. I don't know if it's on our website or not. Uh, might be. I'm not sure. Um, so it depends on your goal. Um, why DNA test is a test that only males can take, and it provides information about um, that male's father's 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 line. We call it the patrilineal line, um, only that line. Um, mitochondrial DNA test is another kind that tells you about a matrilineal line, a mother's 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 mother. Um, that test, either males or females can take it, but it's going to tell either one about their mother's line and on back. Um, the most useful one most of the time is going to be what we call an autosomal DNA test. You know, we call it the cousin finder test also. That's one that gives you information about all of your uh, genetic lines, but it's not as useful in so far as going back as far. It goes back about five or six generations uh, to, to uh, give you information about, you know, fourth to sixth cousins is, is pretty solid, but you get beyond a sixth cousin and, and it's uh, not as useful for that. But that's what we use um, pretty much almost all the time when we're working on an unknown birth family case is that autosomal DNA test. Um, this one too is very general and you can kind of summarize for this person. What is the average cost charged for genealogy research in your experience? No, this is, go ahead. Okay. So, um, you know, I mentioned that in my talk that it, you know, a record lookup, somebody might be charging like 30 bucks an hour to just go find a record for you. Um, if it's an extensive um, extend and verify all my lines, then, you know, as I said in my talk, it might be like $200 an hour or even more. Um, I know with the company that I work for, our, our basic 25, that's the 25 hour project is typically our, our smallest. And um, our, our charge on that is 118 per hour. So the project comes out to be about, I think, $2,950, I believe. And then the more hours you buy, the le a little bit less per hour. Um, so a 50, 50 hour project is gonna be less per hour. And then 100 hours can be even less per hour, for example. Um, but yeah, it is definitely an investment. You know, this has to be something that you really want to do and uh, perhaps something that you've been struggling with for years and you're ready to just get this knocked out. And so you have to consider all the time and effort that you put in in the past. Uh, what is the value of that time going forward? And are you willing to invest that into a professional who might have a better fortunes at um, solving that mystery for you and getting that off your plate. Well, I think our time is running out here, Deborah. We've run over two hours or an hour, almost going towards an hour and a half here. But um, Leslie Johnson wants to say thank you for allowing me to attend this presentation. It was very informative and helpful. So we're glad, Leslie, you joined thank us you, today. Um, and then one last question here, and this one I've gotten to a point where I'm not sure records still exist or exist. Is there a list of record types available? I'm looking for a Mississippi River boat passenger record. Wow, that's specific. <laughs> that one, yeah. She goes from general to real specific here. And uh, so, so the general records, uh, the different uh, databases, you, I would recommend going to the catalogs at uh, ancestry.com and at family search and looking in uh, you know, doing searches on those catalogs for specific uh, places, uh, specific topics and, and seeing what's available as far as collections of records go. Um, I would also do Googling on a subject like that because there may be, um, do you say Mississippi Riverboat? Is that? Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> there are probably 
organizations out there dedicated to preserving that history and heritage. And I would look for some of those organizations and see, you know, they may have an archives even of records associated with that. And uh, I would check that out. Excellent, good old Google. One last question. If you have a valid DNA match on Ancestry, is that the most reliable content you should use to research? It's going to depend on um, how close the match is. And I, since you're saying it, that you think it's valid, uh, I assume that it's fairly close. Um, and so in that case, the answer is yes. Uh, as, they, as we always say, DNA doesn't lie. Uh, sometimes people misinterpret the DNA. You have that, that's the advantage of having a professional is that they may know, uh, be more knowledgeable about how to interpret the result. But yes, DNA is certainly much more reliable than the census takers scribbled notes or um, you know, handwritten records, lots of problems with transcription and um, copying and so forth. And uh, DNA is DNA. And yeah, it, it is the most reliable record we can use. It's true. <laughs> okay. Well, Deborah, I want to thank you for uh, stepping up and doing a presentation yes, that I have never heard anybody give before. And so I'm thrilled that we're able to record it and and use it for our members. And thank Thanks. you so much for all your expertise and many, many good ideas here. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. Always glad to speak for my society. And we'd like to thank everybody for attending today, all our LGS members and all of you who are guests today. Uh, please check our, our uh, website and come back and join us. John, did you want to say any last words before we depart? Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you, John. Okay. Hey, well, thank, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.